Welcome to Chapter 16, Real Estate Financing Principles. Saying this is the practice part, and we talk about the Federal Reserve System, and I think you just should understand the basic components of the Federal Reserve System. I don't think you get too much on it. Uh, here's what you want to know. The Federal Reserve System is our nation's banking system with the uh, 12 district banks, and they can control the flow of money throughout the country. And uh, by doing so, they can maintain credit conditions. They watch out for uh, uh, inflationary uh, trends, and they try to curb that. Also try to curb recessionary trends when they see those happening. So by uh, controlling the ebb and flow of money in our country, they help secure uh, more sound credit conditions for our, our, our country and its people. Uh, counteract inflation, uh, as, as I say, create favorable economic climates, uh, regulates the flow of money and interest rates that we pay on almost everything uh, are eventually uh, determined to us. Interest rates on things from credit cards to, to uh, cars, auto loans, to uh, mortgage loans are all eventually impacted by what the Federal Reserve System does. So now we know a little bit about the goals of the Federal Reserve System, why they exist. Here are the tools they use to implement and accomplish those goals. The first is the reserve requirements. The reserve requirements s simply are a way of keeping money out of the system. How do you keep money out of the economy? You regulate how much cash reserve member banks have to keep in their banks that they're not uh, allowed to lend or give out to individual loans. And in reality, they don't actually keep these reserve requirements at the member banks. The reserves are really kept at the Federal Reserve level. But again, we're just trying to give you some idea of you know how these, these tools kind of broadly work. So as the Fed increases its reserve requirements, it keeps member banks putting more money in reserve and less money in uh, uh, out in the economy and therefore restricting the amount that's available for loans and that will have the effect of increasing interest rates. They use a tool called the discount rate. The discount rate is really the interest rate that the banks pay when they borrow from the reserve. They don't do that quite often. Your book makes this to be a big a big tool of theirs. And while it is a tool, it's not the, the biggest tool that they use. The, uh, the reserve requirements are, and then the next thing I'm going to talk about are. So for our purposes, though, the discount rates would be the interest rates that the Fed charges its member banks when the banks borrow from the Fed. And obviously, if the Fed increases its discount rate to its member banks, then those member banks have to turn around and charge even more on uh, the individual loans that they make. Obviously, again, increasing the uh, interest rates uh, that uh, we as consumers pay. Uh, the, the other tool, the other major tool, which your book doesn't talk about, so you don't have to know this, but I'm going to throw it in just so it makes some sense, is open market operations. This is a tool that's used quite frequently from the, by the Federal Reserve. It's being used today. And what uh, happens with open market uh, operations is the Fed will actually go and buy and sell governmental bonds. And as they are buying bo bonds, they're increasing the bond yields because it's absorbing the bonds that are out there. So any bonds that are there they're, are more expensive, so the interest rates are going up on them. And uh, in turn, uh, th this reduces mortgage rates. There's an inverse relationship between bond rates and mortgage rates. So as the Fed is buying up bonds, it's actually keeping interest rates low. Uh, when they stop buying bonds, uh, interest on the bonds themselves, when they stop buying, will start to go down you know, because of la la lack of demand. And interest rates on mortgages will go in the other direction or they'll go up. So the Federal Reserve, along with the primary mortgage market and the secondary mortgage market, are the three primary players in affecting our um, the health of our economy and uh, what happens with our money and our money supply and interest rates and our ability to buy and uh, borrow. Uh, the primary mortgage market is simply the mar market that is made up of lenders that originate primary loans. These are the these are the institutions that you go to if you, we as individuals want to get loans. Now there's uh, a, a number of these that your book talks about and you can kind of read through page 321 and 322. I think the big thing about this is that you understand that there are 
uh, other places that you can go to uh, besides mortgage brokers for, for uh, loan money. Most of us think about going to mortgage brokers who really don't lend money. They put together borrowers and individuals that, are, that want to lend money together. They're, they're, they're brokers. They bring, if you will, uh, sellers and buyers together uh, for mortgage, mortgage loans. Uh, but you can go to uh, savings associations and commercial banks. Commercial banks don't lend a lot to individuals. Primarily, they would lend to you if you were one of their better customers, and maybe you do. A, maybe your business uh, also banks at a commercial bank, so they might make uh, some, uh, if you will, home loans. Um, insurance companies, uh, you can use uh, your insurance policy to borrow against. Credit unions are becoming an increasingly popular place to uh, borrow uh, money at uh, very competitive interest rates and credit unions are uh, also desirable because their fees are very low. So if you belong to a credit union, you can go there and borrow money to, to buy a home. Pension funds, endowment funds, investment groups, mortgage bankers, mortgage brokers, uh, mutual savings banks. These are all players in the primary mortgage market where individuals like you and I go to when we want to borrow money to uh, and, and, the, and the individuals you're going to be working with that want to borrow money to uh, purchase re uh, residential real estate. The secondary mortgage market, they go to all those people that, limit, that uh, initiate those loans and they buy them up, therefore priming the pump by putting money back into those lending institutions so they continue making loans and making money with loan origination fees. So the secondary mortgage market is the pump that continues to pump money back to the primary mortgage market by buying those notes that they hold. We have Fannie Mae, we have Ginnie Mae, and then we have a group called Freddie Mac. Uh, Fannie Mae uh, purchases all kinds of loans, conventional FHA, VA loan, probably the biggest player in the uh, secondary mortgage market. Uh, Ginnie Mae is the smallest of the three. Uh, they purchase just FHA and VA loans. And Freddie Mac uh, purchases just conventional loans. Probably Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac purchase about 70% of all the loans issued in the primary mortgage market. In the, in the past, the straight loan was the way that lenders lent money. It, isn't a, it wasn't a good idea. This was uh, done back in the 20s. Basically, with straight loans, if the lender lends you money, charge you, charges you interest, maybe quarterly, and then at the end of the term, you have to pay the entire principal back at one time. So uh, that could be very harsh if uh, you know, you're know you a business person and you've had a business calamity, and then all of a sudden, after a certain period of time, you owe the entire amount that you borrowed uh, from them. So amortized loans is typically what we do. It's the best way to be able to finance almost any kind of property, certain real property. And amortized loans simply say that you make one level payment every month. A little of it goes to the lender for interest and a little of it goes to principal. We probably should say a lot goes in the early term to interest and, and a little later. So the amortized loan is the, 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 the good feature to the borrower is they pay one sum each month. And if they do that for the term of the loan, they'll extinguish the debt and the interest that they pay. Uh, the harsh part is that most of their payment in the early term is all interest, so they have little principal reduction with the amortized loan. Uh, with As far as rates, uh, the, the best loan you can have at this day and age is a fixed rate amortized loan. These adjustable rate m mortgages, while they sound good uh, because you have sort of a teaser uh, low interest rates at the early term, which means that your uh, mortgage payments are low in the early term, but then they start to adjust up. Uh, adjustment mortgages is based on a theory that while you can't afford the fixed rate, higher fixed rate right now, we can give you these teaser lower ARMs and we can adjust them up to a fixed or over what this fixed rate would be if you'd gotten a fixed rate to begin with uh, in the future. And that's good for you because in the future we know you're going to be making more money, you're going to be getting your job promotion, you're going to be paying off all your cars, you'll have all your loans paid for, and of course we know that's the big fallacy, isn't it? So when these adjustable rates start adjusting upward, uh, the borrower may be even in a worse position than he was to begin with.
So in addition to the fixed rate mortgage that we talked about and these ARMs, and of course the ARMs, as we said, are these adjustable rates, which you know, sound good, but often in the future we're not in a better situation than we are now. So ARMS were one of the culprits that created our housing crisis when they reset and people just weren't able to pay the increased mortgage payments that they got. Other financing uh, techniques are the balloon payment loan. You should know this. A balloon payment is one where you know, you, uh, it balloons at the end of the uh, term. So you pay a uh, uh, your you know your monthly payments uh, and then the last payment let's say payment 360 is a balloon payment it's larger than the others sometimes these are called partially amortized because while the amortized loans completely pay off everything with one uniform fixed payment the balloon loans the last payment isn't the same as the others prior. It's a larger payment, if you will. It balloons at the end, and so you got a larger payment at the end. Sometimes this can work work well. Sometimes it can't. So a balloon payment is where that last payment is just larger than the rest of the payments that you've been paying. A growing equity mortgage is one where you can in increase the equity in the property as you go along, as you pay more and more towards off to principal, you, you get uh, accelerated equity uh, in, uh, increases in your equity in the property as the principal is reduced. Reverse annuity mortgage, uh, these are uh, 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 rather complicated. Uh, you probably should seek legal advice when you do these. These are good mortgages, uh, but I always recommend that the borrowers uh, seek uh, you know, good professional uh, counseling before they get these. Uh, this essentially is where the lender is uh, lending you money on a property that you're going to remain living in and they're sort of buying you out as you live in the property. These would be uh, ro loans that seniors would have that have a lot of equity in their property. <clears throat> so the lender is actually lending you on the equity in the property <clears throat> and then if that senior dies or if the senior conveys title then the amount that they quote lent you the amount of uh, towards the uh, equity that you have in the property would have to be repaid to the lender so it's a way of taking all that equity that seniors are sitting on if they've got their houses paid for and getting some monthly payments back to them so these can be very very desirable loans but as I say always want to seek a legal counsel or, or good uh, counseling before you uh, enter into those an unrecourse loan is uh, the, the loan that um, many of us would like to have on our businesses. These non-recourse loans say that we'll do our best to pay it back, Mr. Lender, but if we can't, you can't come after us personally. So to the extent that you get a non-recourse loan, it's the safest loan that you can have as a borrower. That way they, you can't be sued uh, as an individual for non-payment. It's all based on, let's say, the, uh, the viability uh, of, uh, of a business and not of an individual. So there's that balloon payment. We should we should know that one of, of all those here. Conventional loans, conventional loans are loans uh, that uh, uh, generally we have 20% down. Uh, it's the most secure loan usually to a lending institution uh, because uh, the lender has to meet the front end and back end ratios. Uh, so we know that they're uh, they're good. They have uh, you know the ability to pay back the loan. Uh, this will loan will be within their affordability indexes. 28% uh, front end ratio, as you might remember from I think the second chapter in the book. Uh, that's your housing ratio. Uh, you should have not be paying any more than 28% of your monthly payment should go to housing. That's, you know, principal, interest, taxes, insurance. The back end ratio is you shouldn't be paying any more than 36% for all of your monthly debt. And if you can fall within those two ratios uh, of the uh, housing ratio and, and the back end ratio of all your debt ratio, then you, this should be, the loan should be affordable for you. Lenders happy, you should be happy and, and secure in paying, paying that back. Sometimes if you put less than 20% down, the lender will require you to get private mortgage insurance, which basically is a private mortgage insurance company that you pay with monthly, Mr. Borrower, a, a small fee every month for mortgage insurance, which uh, tells the lender that if for some reason you they have to go to foreclosure, uh, the private mortgage insurance company will actually pay the lender any loss the lender might get by going through foreclosure by take by by your by the lender 
lending uh, a, on a loan with less than 20% down. Obviously, the less you put down, the higher the risk the lender takes. So mortgage, you know, private mortgage insurance helps insure the lender on those uh, high loan-to-value ratio loans. FHA loans are loans uh, where our current limit is $729,000, so that's pretty substantial. Uh, FHA loans are for folks that sort of uh, can buy a, uh, a nice property, but these aren't for the, if you will, uh, uh, McMansions. Uh, this is a program that helps stimulate home ownership uh, because in some cases uh, the, the uh, uh, lender uh, doesn't have to uh, get 20% down from the borrower. Uh, so they'll take uh, s smaller down payments as low as 3.5%, so that helps borrowers. Uh, they regulate the interest rates, so the interest rates are generally bef below what, what uh, current mortgage rates would be. And the federal government says through the FHA loans, lender, if you will do this FHA loan, take less percent down, take lower interest rates, we'll insure the borrower. And of course, this is what happened with the great housing crisis we have now. That's where Fannie Mae uh, has had to go out, and FHA and Fannie Mae and Ginnie Mae, with all these insured loans, had to go out and pay all these lenders because the le the, they were selling properties at foreclosure sales and not getting the full amount of what, what the amount of loan was. So this, this sort of imploded on everybody. FHA loans are loans uh, where our current limit is $729,000, so that's pretty substantial. Uh, FHA loans are for folks that sort of uh, can buy a, a nice property, but these aren't for the, if you will, uh, uh, McMansions. Uh, this is a program that helps stimulate home ownership uh, because in some cases they're, uh, the, the uh, uh, lender uh, doesn't have to uh, get 20% down from the borrower, uh, so they'll take uh, s smaller down payments as low as 3.5%, so that helps borrowers. Uh, they regulate the interest rates, so the interest rates are generally bef below what, what uh, current mortgage rates would be. And the federal government says through the FHA loans, lender, if you will do this FHA loan, take less percent down, take lower interest rates, we'll insure the borrower. And of course, this is what happened with the great housing crisis we have now. That's where Fannie Mae uh, has had to go out, and FHA and Fannie Mae and Ginnie Mae, with all these insured loans, had to go out and pay all these lenders because the le the, they were selling properties at foreclosure sales and not getting the full amount of what, what the amount of loan was. So this, this sort of imploded on everybody. FHA advantages, you can borrow the closing costs. Um, the qualifying ratios can be higher than they were on those conventional loans. Uh, you will have to get mortgage insurance, MIP. Uh, you can, somebody can assume them. There aren't any prepayment penalties. Uh, and so they can they uh, can bend some of the credit standards. When In fact, now what's happened is they've gone too far the other way. Uh, so VA loans are loans to veterans. Uh, given by the Veterans Administration, and they're actually guaranteed. Uh, the FHA are insured loans. VA loans are guaranteed by the Veterans Administration. Uh, you're issued a certificate of eligibility. Uh, not only does it apply to veterans, but also to their uh, non-married uh, spouses, if they're still alive. Uh, and uh, uh, they uh, were, you know, where the uh, death was military-related. Uh, there's a CRV given where they determine uh, how much they will uh, give you or guarantee, uh, guarantee as far as a VA loan, uh, and that's what that CRV is. So once you're issued one of those, you can see how much you can, quote, get. Uh, so VA loans are loans to veterans. Uh, given by the Veterans Administration, and they're actually guaranteed. Uh, the FHA are insured loans. VA loans are guaranteed by the Veterans Administration. Uh, you're issued a certificate of eligibility. Uh, not only does it apply to veterans, but also to their uh, non-married uh, spouses, if they're still alive. Uh, and uh, uh, they uh, were, you know, where the uh, death was military-related. 
and there's a CRV given where they determine uh, how much they will uh, give you or guarantee, uh, guarantee as far as a VA loan uh, and that's what that CRV is so once you're issued one of those you can see how much you can quote get in some cases 100 percent financing and use that to purchase property So these are some advantages to the VA loans. Again, your book kind of talks about them, but I think the big thing you want to know is FHA loans are insured, VA loans are guaranteed, and you should know what that CRV is, Certificate of Reasonable, Va Reasonable Value, that will be issued by the VA and basically tell you how much you are, uh, you know, the, the property that you're buying, whether or not they will, in fact, uh, a guarantee the loan on that property. It's kind of CRB is kind of like an appraiser, appraisal that is given by an appraiser, and if you, you fall within the the Veterans Administration guidelines, then uh, you based on that CRB uh, that will tell the v Veterans Administration whether or not they should in fact guarantee the loan. Purchase money mortgage, we should know that. When you see purchase money mortgage, that's where the owner becomes the mortgagee. So I own my property free and clear. You want to buy it. You Let's say you can't get a loan, and I tell you, not a problem. I'll become the lender. So you make a down payment to me of whatever we agree to. You make mortgage payments to me for 5, 10, 20 years, whatever it's going to be. And then you, I, I pretend like I'm the lender, and you pay me. And you give me the note in the mortgage. If you don't pay me under the note, I can foreclose just like a just like a, a mortgage lender would. So purchase money mortgage, the owner is the lender or mortgagee. Blanket mortgage is a mortgage that covers more than one parcel and provides for partial releases. This is a mortgage that developers might use. So they get one master mortgage over all 200 lots of their subdivision. Every time somebody purchases a lot or purchase, purchases a home built on the lot, and you pay that um, developer, uh, he pays off a little of that to the lender, and the lender releases the master the mortgage over all of the parcels, uh, uh, releases a lien uh, just on the parcel that you're purchasing. So you've got the master loan, and then there will be releases every time somebody buys one of those lots, blanket mortgage. A package mortgage is a mortgage that is not only on real property but also on personal property. Think of a condominium when you go to purchase a, condo a brand new condominium. Uh, that loan that you get is not only covering the real property but it's also going to include the dit washer and dryer if it's included in the sale, the dishwasher, the appliances, <coughs> other items of personal property. So typically a condo loan would be considered a package loan. Uh, package mortgage uh, that would cover not only the real property you're buying, the condo itself, but any personal property that's also included in the sale. An open-end mortgage, uh, home equity loan, gem we've talked about a little bit, construction loan, these things are, you know, you might look them over in the book and not really ask too much. I don't think you're getting any questions over these, but these are other ways of financing, helping uh, developers or borrowers uh, get into a property and being able to afford it. A sale leaseback, uh, uh, that's actually a financing term whereby the seller becomes the tenant and the buyer becomes the landlord. Think uh, here of a large, um, say, a, a, a large industrial building. Uh, so I own a 500,000 square foot uh, paper company uh, and I've got the trucking docks and all of the uh, attendant office space and it's worth, let's say, $10 million. If I could only sell it, I could raise $10 million and plow it back in my business. But the problem is if I sell it, then i got to move. There aren't a lot of $500,000 square foot facilities I can go to. So what I do is I get investors. And I tell the investors, how would you like to have a great tenant? I'll sell you my building and I'll lease it back and I'll become your tenant. This would be a good investor investment for you. So a sale leaseback is typically done as a financing technique to loosen up all of the equity that an owner has in a large industrial building, can use that money to enhance their business. The investor gets a great tenant, uh, and you're able to uh, uh, get uh, large sums of cash on the, quote, sale that you've made. 
a buy down uh, you here is very similar to like the discount rates we talked about uh, you pay something up front and that buys down the interest for a period of time that's where those discount points would come in uh, truth in lending is called the regulation Z we should know that the truth in lending law says that when uh, ever uh, a lender advertises lending rates they must tell the prospective borrower under Truth in Lending Act what the true cost of borrowing the money is and that's what this APR is. The APR is an interest rate that is computed uh, and uh, on uh, and taking into account all of the financing terms that are involved not just the amount of money that you're paying back which would be the contract rate. So when you go to borrow money not only are you borrowing money at a certain contract rate and paying that back, but you also may be paying for appraisal fees, loan origination fees, loan processing fees, um, and other fees. Well, if you add those into your cost of getting that loan, that's what creates the APR. So the APR pr uh, percentage is usually a little bit higher, is going to be a little bit higher than the contract rate because it takes into account other financing terms involved in that sale than just the contract rate. And that's what you should be shopping, the APR. That'll be the true cost as you compare lender to lender, what their APRs are, not really what their contract rates are when they lend you money, but what that APR is. That's, the, the, that's what you're shopping, APR, APR rates. So our, uh, Regulation Z requires that all financing costs are uh, put in uh, advertising. So anytime you advertise any kind of number, Mr. Lender, you have to include the APR, also known as Regulation Z, Truth in Lending. Uh, there is a three-day right of rescission on many loans, not all loans, but on many loans there's a three-day right of rescission that after you get that loan you can rescind it after three days. But as I say, read that very carefully. That does not apply to all mortgage loans. Of course, it regulates advertising. The big deal is the APR. APRs must be advertised anytime you advertise any any term in a loan, changing the APR that you pay. So your APR might be 7.14%. That's what needs to be advertised. Uh, RESPA is a lending act that requires the lender uh, to give, and by the way, uh, RESPA is sometimes called Regulation X. Regulation X requires that a lender, when you go to borrow money, they must give you a, the loan officer must give you a loan booklet called Settlement Costs in You or something when you have loan application. They must give you a good faith estimate of what it's going to cost you to close this loan, Mr. Borrower, so you know how much money you're going to have to take out of your pocket to, to get the loan. And then it requires the use of what's called the HUD-1 Uniform Closing Statement. Uh, must use a closing and uh, the borrower must be allowed to review that closing statement prior to closing. Three days is the minimum. One of the other primary goals is to prohibit any kickbacks so that RESPA statement, that closing statement, must show where all the fees that uh, borrowers and lenders and agents uh, get and pay, real estate agents, loan officers, all the money in the transaction, whoever gets paid, uh, must be shown, uh, even if it's a referral fee from one party to the next. Okay, do your end of chapter tests.